be aware that the uh, recent decision of the United uh, States Supreme Court regarding abortion has caused heated debates on social networks and uh, <laughs> uh, one of our uh, one of our prospective members here in Serbia asked me if I could deliver a message on abortion in Serbian language. I didn't have no need to give you any such uh, message in English because you know what abortion is and most uh, people in America, including nominal Christians, know what kind of crime that is. Uh, here in our country, during the communist regime or socialist regime, abortion was legalized even as early as 1953, 20 years before it was legalized in the United States. So, uh, you know, the knowledge about abortion and what it is and how it is seems to be particularly amiss here in this country. So I delivered during the week, I delivered a message in Serbian language in which I gave a witness to my nation and to all those who want to listen in our language what abortion is and what kind of terrible murder it is. So, uh, just man, don't want, want to mention that to you. Perhaps you're not aware that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court's decision has caused these kinds of heated debates in our medias and on social networks. Uh, and uh, now we are in the third and the last installment related to the Platinum Jubilee, which Queen Elizabeth celebrated last month, is the longest ruling monarch in Europe and in the world and on the throne of David. And I wanted to remind you, the, uh, remind you of the origin of the British throne and British crown because it goes far, far, far back into the past, far, far, far back into the Old Testament times. It's all related to God's promise that there will be always a descendant, a physical descendant of King David upon his throne. And Queen Elizabeth indeed is the longest ruling monarch in that position. Uh, perhaps many people are not aware that all the European royal families actually originate with Judah, believe it or not. Because remember in Genesis 49, verse 10, when Jacob was dying, he gave a prophecy to, he gave series of prophecies to each one of his sons. In those prophecies, he told his sons what their descendants would be accomplishing in the last days, in our days. And uh, in Genesis 49.10, to his son Judah, he said that his son Judah, the scepter, which means the crowns, meaning the uh, uh, royal positions, scepter, will not depart from Judah. And uh, obviously, Judah had two sons, twin sons, Phares, from which came King David, and there was Zara. And the family of Zara left the uh, Middle East, they left the Promised Land uh, at some time. They mingled with other migrating nations, of which there were many were belonging to the lost Israelites, and they migrated uh, along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, first to Spain and then to Ireland. And then in Ireland they formed, they established a royal household. To that household was added Tamar Tefi, the daughter of the last Jewish king Zedekiah, she was brought to Ireland by Prophet Jeremiah indeed. We'll go, next Sabbath we'll continue to analyze the book of Jeremiah. So Prophet Jeremiah brought Tamar Tefi to, uh, to Ireland. And then that is how the throne of David was transplanted from the house of Judah to the house of lost Israel. And to this day that throne is standing still. We have seen that in the last 70 years a turbulent kind of period happened. And I guess with the uh, either death of the current queen or her abdication possible, we can see probably the end of one epoch, one era of our world, and uh, we will probably be ushered in into the uh, next phase, <laughs> so to speak, of this uh, end times. Uh, her son is not much popular, as you probably know, Not certainly not as much as she is. In fact, her... Grandson William is far more popular among the public than uh, Prince Charles. So that's another factor in all of this equation. We'll probably see now from this point on after her death or abdication, the weakening of the Commonwealth and we'll probably see the uh, further economic decline, not to mention moral decline, of the British nation, not to mention the possibility that Scotland may gain independence, perhaps even Wales. Not to mention that German, Germany is on rise. Not to mention that the German European 
European army is eventually going to defeat and destroy the British Isles. Not to mention that before that there will be economic sanctions according to Ezekiel chapter 6, economic sanctions imposed by the European Union against Britain, which will cause tremendous economic and other hardships in on that island. Take, for example, uh, the fact that many people in Britain depend on drugs, medical drugs, and the main medical drugs pro the producer in Europe is, oh, ooh, well, Germany and Bayer. So once you have sanctions slammed against Britain, dear friends, it will mean that many or a significant portion of the British society is going to die for the lack of medicine. And I could just now go endlessly giving you, if you want, speculations or expectations what will happen to Britain, but it's all certain because it's written in the Bible. It's written in the Bible, but we have been privileged only once because there will be no more any monarch sitting on David's throne for this long. We've been privileged in our lives to witness the Platinum Jubilee of the current Queen Elizabeth. And that was the occasion through which I wanted to basically remind you why it is all significant. It's all part of God's plan. And we came and this, in this last installment, I just want to remind you of the second son of Judah, Zara, called the Prince of the Scarlet Thread. And I want to remind you of that there were three overth- overth- overthrows of this, of this throne, or three overturns, and this throne is now currently there where it is, and it's supposed to, of course, Jesus Christ, when he comes, he's going to establish that throne again in Jerusalem, and he is going to be king over that throne, and he is going to rule the house of Israel, the remnant of the house of Israel, as well as the rest of the world, in the kingdom of God. Now, as far as there, Zara, the prince of the scarlet thread, there is very little in the scripture that applies specifically to him. He is the prince of Judah as well. He was a twin brother to Pharis. His immediate posterity is given in First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6, and there we read about his sons. So, First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6. And the sons of Zara, Zimri, and Ethan, and Hermon, and Calcol, and Dara, five of them in all. Now, two of his descendants... You'll recognize their names uh, in the book of Psalms because they're given, two of his descendants are given as authors of certain of the Psalms. And also when Solomon was describing his great wisdom in 1 Kings chapter 4 verse 31, when he was describing his great king, uh, in his great wisdom, his wisdom was compared as greater and uh, qualified as greater than the wisdom of Zara's descendants. 1 Kings 4 31, so his wisdom is greater than Ethan, the Ezrahite, and Hermon, and Calcol, and Darda. So even though we don't have much in scripture about this, these people, there is a bountiful supply of data in historical records. Of course, they're generally overlooked by Bible scholars. But all that wonderful secular data sheds light on the fulfillment of Jeremiah's commission. Remember, Jeremiah's commission was to... Uh, basically uproot the uh, throne of David from Jerusalem and to transplant it into a lost, into the lost Israelites, among the lost Israelites. And it seems certain that the family of Zara aspired to the scepter of Judah, but of course they failed to attain their ambitions. And after a time, the entire household of Zara have migrated out of the promised land. And where the scriptures allow the record of Zara's line to lapse, and it's certainly per- for, for a purpose, we find that secular history, history provides the necessary clues, and then when we connect all those clues, we have the clear picture. So when properly fitted together, and properly put together, these enable us to blend the whole into one continuous recital down to the present day. Now, an examination of some of the historical clues, brethren, reveals that Darda, the Egyptian, as he's called in some records, son of Zara, was actually Dardanus, the Egyptian founder of Troy. Hecateus, who is the uh, Greek historian, Hecateus of Abdera, he is a Greek historian from the 4th century before Christ. He writes that, he tells us that the Egyptians, formerly being troubled by calamities, in order that the divine wrath might be averted, expelled all the aliens gathered together in Egypt. 
And of these under their leaders Danus and Cadmus, these who were led, led by two, these two people migrated to Greece. Now the calamity is obvious. He refer to uh, plagues which God brought down on of the of the Egyptians, and the aliens were indeed the Israelites. And you see, some of them migrated to Greece, with led by Danus and Cadmus, while some others, many others, indeed were under the leadership of Moses. They exiled into the wilderness and then they were led to Sinai. When they signed the covenant with God, they became his nation and then they were later led into the promised land. Diodorus, another historian, has the same version, well, the same story with some version, which is basically this, that the Egyptians mentioned that after these events, a great number of colonies were spread from Egypt all over the inhabited world. They also say that those who set forth with Danus or Danaus likewise were from Egypt and that they settled what is practically the oldest city of Greece, Argos, and that the nations of the Colchi in Pontus and that of the Jews, remnant of Judah, which lies between Arabia and Syria, were founded as colonies by certain emigrants from their country. And this is indeed proven by the long-established institutions among the, those people, and that was of circumcision. So they circumcised their male children. That was the custom which they brought over from Egypt it, and recorded to us from the Odorus. Even the Athens or the Athenians, the, uh, the uh, inhabitants of the Greek capital, Egyptians say that even the Athenians are colonists from Sais in Egypt. Now, the other interesting thing is now about the descendants of Darda. His descendants, brethren, ruled ancient Troy for some hundreds of years until the city was destroyed in the famous Siege of Troy. There is a movie, I think, that you know uh, about Troy. Uh, perhaps it's a little bit romant romant romanticized, as, as American movies tend to be from time to time. But I watched that movie and I was very impressed indeed with, uh, with all that I had seen. So, uh, Troy... The descendants of Darda, descendants of Zara's uh, son Darda, had obviously a royal family that was ruling that was ruling over the ancient Troy. Now there was one remnant of that royal blood, Aeneas, so he is of that royal blood, Zara Judah. He collected the remnants of his nation and he traveled with them to Italy, and there he married the daughter of Latinus king of the Latins, and subsequently he founded the great Roman Empire. Now his son, Aeneas' son, or grandson, whose name was Brutus, with a large party of the Trojans, he migrated to Malta, and there he was advised to re-establish his people in the Great White Island. That was the early name for Britain, because it has these uh, uh, chalk, chalk cliffs, you know, especially Dover is known for its chalk cliffs, so it was called in the ancient times, the, uh, the, the, the white great, the white great island. And, uh, of course, Brutus took this advice. And that advice is recorded, you wouldn't believe, in, ar in an archaic Greek form on the temple of Diana in Caer Troia or New Troy. And even to this day, there's a historical stone which stands in the town of Totnes on the shores of Torbay commemorating the coming of Brutus to British Isles. It was about 100, 100, uh, 1130 before Christ. And then when he arrived to the British Isles, Brutus made contact with his kindred blood, and he built for himself a new capital city to which he gave the name Caer Troia, or New Troy. The Romans later called it Londinium, and now, of course, we know that city is London. You see, even in the name of London, we have this... Uh, Trace of Dan, we have the sign of Dan, sign to which and where the lost Israelites migrated. Now, the actual date of the founding of London is indeed suggested in the Welsh Bardic literature, which says that uh, that, but that Brutus finished his city, he strengthened it with walls and castles, he consecrated the city and made inflexible laws for the governance, and he put protection on the city and granted privileges to it. At the same time, uh, who was in Judea? Well, at that time, it was Belly the priest, says the, says the Wolf's literature, that Belly the priest ruled in Judea, and the Ark of the Covenant was in captivity to the Philistines. Now, of course, this reference 
to Beli, the priest, obviously is a reference to Eli, uh, who is found in the first book of Samuel. So you see, such remote prehistorical antiquity of the site of London is indeed confirmed by the numerous archaeological remains which are found there, not only of the New Stone and Early Bronze Age, but even of the Old Stone Age, which is an indication to us that it was already a settlement at that time when Brut Brutus selected it for the site of his new capital, New Troy. There is a publication called the Harmsworth Encyclopedia, and according to that encyclopedia, Kekrops, or Kalkol, of 1 Chronicles 2 and 6, or Halkol of 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31, is one and the same person, so he is brother of Darda, that he was the mythical father of Athens and its first king. He was thought to have been originally a leader of a band of colonists from Egypt. There is an ethnologist, Dr. Latham, who says that neither do I think, this is the quote from Dr. Latham, neither do I think that the eponyms of the Argive Danai was other than that of the Israelite tribe of Dan. Only we are so used to confine ourselves to the soil of Palestine in our consideration of the history of the Israelites that we treat them as they were ad scripti globae and ignored and ignored the share they may have they may have taken in the ordinary history of the world. Well indeed, you see, brethren, because the tribe of Zara, the family of Zara left the promised land, and the eyes of God are always as I always tell you, the eyes of God are always fixed on the promised land. So once even the Israelites left the promised land being driven out by the Assyrians, once they were out of the sight, we know about them by uh, reading the secular sources. As soon as they get out of the promised land, you know, they're out of God's sight and then he doesn't mention them in his word. But the secular lit literature, nevertheless, the secular history, gives us enough proof of where they went, how they migrated and who they are, that they're the lost house of Israel indeed. Now, historical records also tell us of the westward migration of the descendants of Halkol along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. You see, and they, as they migrated, they established Iberian or Hebrew trading settlements. You know that where the Spain and Portugal are today is called the Iberian Peninsula. You see, one settlement in that peninsula today is called Saragossa, in the Ebro Valley in Spain, but it was originally known as Zaragasa, meaning the stronghold of Zara. And then from Spain, they continued westward as far as Ireland. The Iberians gave their name to Ireland, calling the, 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 the island Iberne, which was later abbreviated to Erne, and subsequently Latinized to Hibernia, a name that still st uh, you know, adheres to Ireland. Now, interestingly enough, even in the pre-Exodus days, Abraham's descendants were called, still called by their more ancient names, Hebrews. You find that Hebrews in, second, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 6 and verse 13. They're also called Heberites in Numbers 25, being descended from Heber. Uh, and Heber was known as great-great-grandson, and the great-great-great-great-grandson or uh, grandfather of Abraham. And thus the Hibernians or Iberians who came to Ireland about 1,600 before Christ, they were undoubtedly Hebrews, descended from Abraham through Judah's son Zera and grandson Halchol. Now later history records, uh, it records that these people grew considerably and expanded into Scotland. And that's very important indeed because the first trans the, the transplant throne among the Israelites now went from Ireland, at one point went to Scotland, then later went to England, and it was uh, established basically uh, in the Westminster Abbey, and there you, we have the uh, coronation chair where the stone of, uh, of destiny was placed, and upon that stone, all of those monarchs from Scotland, from England, from, even from Ireland, since Tamar Teffi arrived to, to, to the island of Jeremiah, Always all those monarchs were crowned on that throne. Um, I mentioned who was Heber, so he was known as great great grandson and the great 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 father of Ab of, of, of Abram, grandfather of Abram that is, and thus the word Hibernians, the name Hibernians or Iberians, as I said to came to Ireland, they were undoubtedly all Hebrews. 
But, you know, don't make mistake. All Jews are Hebrews, but not all Hebrews are Jews. Jews are part of the house of Judah, part of the tribe of Judah. But not all Hebrews are Jews, you know, even though all Jews are indeed Hebrews. Uh, later history records that, you know, people from Ireland, as I said, they grew considerably and they expanded into Scotland, and that is very significant. Now, many historical records point to Israel's presence, particularly the presence of the tribe of Dan and Judah, in Ireland at a very early date. Now, you should not be surprised why Judah, because there is a peninsula in Dan, in Denmark, called Judenland, Jutland, or Judenland, and many, many of those who were of the tribe of Judah, they migrated and came to that most northern, uh, most northern uh, point in Europe, and then they sailed across the sea and they populated Scotland and Ireland, uh, and then of course after them came other tribes and other settlers, and they mingled and mixed with them. So there is a considerable uh, presence of Israel. Uh, in in Ireland, particularly of the tribes of Dan and the tribe of Judah. Now, on Ptolemy's ancient map of Ireland, we find in the northeastern corner of the island names as Dansovar, Dan's resting place, and Dansobairs, Dan's habitation, etc. Gladstone's Juventus Mundi and the old Psalter of Cashel, they both state that some of the Grecian Greek Danai left Greece and invaded Ireland. Now, writers such as Petanius and Hecates of Abdera, who was from the 6th century, they speak of Danai as being Hebrew people, originally from Egypt, who colonized Ireland. Well, the history of Ireland, written by Moore, states that the ancient Irish, called the Danai or Danes, that they separated from Israel around the time of the Exodus, and from Egypt they crossed to Greece and then invaded Ireland. The Tuatha de Danan means the tribe of Dan. The Labacha Gabhala, or Book of Conquest of Ireland, give their earlier name as Tuatha de, meaning people of God. And the great Irish histori historiographer named Eugene O'Curry says, quote, the, uh, the, 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 the Danan, were a global, a people remarkable for their knowledge of the domestic, if not the higher, arts of civilized life. Now, interesting to know is the ships of the Teotah de Danan are accredited with bringing Jeremiah and Jacob's pillar to Ireland, as well as, of course, bringing the rest of the company of Jeremiah with them. Uh, now, there is also there are also some chronicles and 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 early records of Ireland. They, they are known as Plantation of Ulster, and uh, they're the best preserved and they're most complete. They date back to about 700 before Christ, and they record the, uh, basically, they record the first important settlements of Hebrews in Ireland. Now, one section of these chronicles are known as the Milesian Records. They are named Milesian, meaning warrior, because they give an account of the genealogy and history of Gallam, or William, the conqueror of Ireland, the last person mentioned in that genealogy. And among the names in the genealogy of Gallam are several that are specifically mentioned as belonging to the red or scarlet branch of Judah. Now, the Milesians invaded Ireland about 1000 before Christ, subjugating the tribe of Dan, most conquerors usually come to despise their conquered, but the Milesians were totally opposite. They came to honor and almost worship those who they had subdued. And later generations of Milesians, uh, to whom, who inherited basically uh, the wonderful traditions of the De Danan, uh, the ones they have conquered, they lifted them into a mystic realm. realm. You know, they missed them, they lifted them into the greatest ones, becoming gods, gods and goddesses, which actually gave rise to the early belief that the people in question were mythological. Now, both the Tuatha de Danan or the Danan, de, Danan, de Danans and Milesians were kinsmen. They long, uh, you know, long ages before they had separated from the main Hebrew stem. Many historians today erroneously believe to these people as Celts and Gauls, whereas in fact they were only forerunners of the Celtic tribes that wound their several ways across Europe from the east, turbulently meeting and finally blending in amity and flowing onward 
in one great Gallic stream into the islands of Britain. The Celts were also kinsmen brethren, but mainly of the later westward migration of the Israelite tribes following their captivity in Assyria between 745 and 721 before Christ. Now, uh, it was Zara's hand bound with a scarlet thread that probably accounts for the origin of the heraldic sign employed today in Ulster in Northern Ireland, and you might be very surprised to see, actually, uh, the heraldry of Northern Ireland. There is a heraldry. There is a, on one heraldry there is a crown, there is a six-pointed star, the star of David, and there is a totally scarlet or red hand right in the midst of that star. So, interestingly enough, even if people don't want to accept what the facts are, the heraldry is always going to remind them of who they are. Now, the throne of David was supposed to be overturned three times. Uh, you find that in Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 21, and in verse 35, it says three times the word overthrow. I'll overthrow, overthrow, overthrow it, the, the throne of David. And then he said that he would overthrow it and then give it to somebody else. Well, uh, basically, that takes the stone from Jerusalem and after the city's destruction, and then it, we find it at Tara in, in, in Ireland. Now, from Bethel to Westminster, it's a long distance in both time and space, and any attempt to connect the two involves the necessity of reconstructing a consecutive and feasible story. There is a tradition that has subsisted from time immemorial, and it is quoted officially, you know, it's quoted as official guide, and the history says that the Stone of Stones set in the Coronation Throne in Westminster Abbey is not other than that on which the head of Jacob rested when he dreamed of the ladder with angels ascending and descending upon it. So it is just, you know, is that just an incredible fable? Is it, is, is it just something interesting that we should throw off? Well, you see, brethren, traditions do not spring from nothing. And this one is, you know, at least worthy of impartial examination indeed. Plus, the only of all the churches of God out there, only Philadelphia has been given the key of David. And with that key of David, the Philadelphians are able to understand the identity of modern house of David, as well as the fact that they need to understand and are able to understand the modern identity of uh, the ten tribes of Israel. Now, basically, the story of Jacob's pillar may be likened to an arch, the left-hand span on which, starting at Bethel, carries us through biblical history up to the destruction of Jerusalem about 584 before Christ. And then the right-hand span, you might say, of the arch begins at Westminster Abbey in Britain and reaches backward to Tara in Ireland just after 584 before Christ. Now the keystone upon which the story rests is the first overturning contained in Ezekiel's prophecy, as I mentioned. All three overturning are contained there. And that takes the stone from Jerusalem after the city's destruction at Tara. Now, the arrival in Ireland of the Bethel stone rests upon the authority of the ancient records of Ireland and the traditions which abound in that country. Uh, well, there's an interesting uh, thing to understand that the ancient historical legends of Israel are, generally speaking, far from being baseless myths. The, not only were they, you know, happenings, were the, were the great happenings that marked great epoch and shrined in their memory, however, even little events that trivially affected the history of their race were and are seldom forgotten. Now, there were Irish poets, and there were Irish uh, Shanahi, the historians, there was a Shanaki of the remotest antiquity uh, were honored next to the king, basically because of the tremendous value which the people set upon the recording and preserving of their history. Now, interestingly enough, the poet and the historian followed, following the fashion of their time, they took advantage of their artist's privilege to color their narrative to an extent that the, you know, that to the modern mind, would seem fantastic. But it was, you know, with the details of the stone that they 
were granted this liberty, and of course the big essential facts had to remain unaltered. The things of importance, no poet of repute, however highly he might color, uh, could or would dare to identify. Therefore, however, you know, strange are the, uh, the storytellers and the storytellers' description of ancient tradition, which, oh, well, when examined carefully, provide substantial links which give credence to the basic truths of the basic truth of the traditions. Now, the modern part of the story from Westminster back to Ireland rests on a succession that we have provided and a succession of well-authenticated Irish, Scottish and English historical documents which may be regarded as practically undisputed. Now, the writers of the subject, quoting from such works as the, the Chronologies of Erie, the Annals of the Four Masters, the Annals of Clomancois, etc., well, those, uh, you know, the, the, those Erics, those sources, they naturally, such as early records as, as these are, uncertain as to date, but from the manuscript Kebrancis Ke Eversus, published in Latin in 1662 and translated in 1841, the year about, well, usually it was about 584 before Christ, may be taken as the Tara starting date. Now, the Chronologies of Scotland by Hector Boyes, translated into, into Scottish by John Bellenden in 1531, they tell us the ancient ancestor of the Scots, was Anegre Kalit Gathilus, Gathilus. He was father of Elchite, the Heremon, Kekrops, Calcol of Athens, and otherwise uh, 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 he was basically ruling in, in, in Argus, or he was originating from Argus. The king of Egypt, king of Ar Argives, who came to Egypt when in this time reigned in Egypt Pharaoh, ye, uh, ye scourge of, of ye people of Israel. Now, the Chronicles of Scotland, they continue the story of Cathelus, recording that he left Egypt with his wife Scotta, his friend and company of Greeks and Egyptians, and then he sailed away and went basically to Spain, later to, uh, later to Ireland. Uh, I've got here a little, uh, uh, well, presentation of Tara, how it was well organized and ordered. It seems that Tatef, his husband, was very busy indeed with that. Uh, there were, well, for example, there were just houses for each of the provincial kings. When they come to the capital, they had enough time to, re to get rested, and uh, they would get to the capital in order to hold the meeting of the, uh, of the basically national, national assembly. So they had a parliament, you see. And the whole scenery and all the uh, arrangements of that, of, of Tara, was absolutely amazing. And uh, there are many songs in the Irish history and Irish poetic uh, streams that indeed glorify Tamar Tefi. And, uh, you know, they also give us great words of praise for these wonderful princes that came from the Middle East all over to Ireland to basically uh, reshape and bring great blessings to that to that place. The, the actual burial site of Tamar Tefi is unknown today. Uh, however, there were, you know, uh, interesting uh, places at Tara Place with uh, markings which suggest that there was a grave vault of Ire Ireland's first queen of the Davidic line. And then, who knows, perhaps one of these days we'll get more relics and there'll be uh, more confident, more evidence will be more more confident, we'll have more confidence and more evidence to convince all that God kept his covenant with David, as he promised in Second Samuel chapter 7 verse 13, that there will be always a descendant on David's throne. Uh, tradition has it that the harp of David was brought to Ireland by Jeremiah and is buried with Teatefi at Tara. It is a significant fact that the royal arms of Ireland is a representation of the harp of David, 
and has been such, you know, for 2,500 years. The first mention of the uh, of the harp, Davis harp, is found in the Din Lianchis uh, by Mac Avalgain, who lived in 574 before Christ. And then we can speak, you know, much about all of that. Uh, you have seen Dr. Bob Thiel being last month in uh, in, in in Ireland, and he went to be to uh, Northern Ireland, and he also went to uh, well, well, he went to another place that seems to be perhaps a Jeremiah's tomb. There are interesting hieroglyphs that are written in in in, in that other that other place that is purported to be Jeremiah's uh, Jeremiah's resting place, basically. Uh, you know, there was, there seems to be a representation of an eclipse, lunar eclipse. Uh, there were five lines, probably, uh, depicting the five, uh, voyagers from Egypt to, uh, to Ireland, etc., etc. Uh, basically, the interpretation of the hieroglyphs is this, uh, that, uh, it's well. It's basically this calculation established by the date, by uh, established the date. You know that on October 16, 583 before Christ, a date which is consistent with the stellar calculations of the mysterious inscriptions, because these kinds of uh, well, it seems almost like astrological images. Uh, so a stellar uh, calculation was made. You see of the uh, astronomical interpretation of the these hieroglyphs and their various. Uh, interpretations given, but we can see that perhaps there are two ships being there uh, drawn, which would basically be one ger journey of Jeremiah and then another journey of Jeremiah, and so on. Now let us see some other things. Basically, we can conclude with all of this that you see the crowning, uh, the crowning of Tamar Tefi became the long line of the Davidic descendants who ruled over first Ireland. As Irish grew stronger in number and in power, they basically extended all of their all their population to Scotland. And uh, also later from Scotland, the crown or the stone was moved to England. Right now, the stone, famous, famous stone, Leah file, basically is... Uh, the stone that was returned to Scotland because Scottish people believed that it's their part of their national identity, so they wanted to have that uh, that stone on the Isle of Iona, where their royal palace was located in the past. Uh, so basically, the first overturning of the throne was in Jerusalem. It was destroyed in Jerusalem by uh, Babylonian armies. And then it was transplanted among the lost Israelites. Obviously, uh, you see, when Tamar Tefi, about 584 before Christ, was crowned on that very stone, along with her husband, Elchid Hermon, and then a long line of Irish uh, rulers came from that marriage, indeed. That was the first overturn. The second overturn happened when... The Irish have extended their power so much that they conquered basically Isle, uh, Scotland. And uh, uh, there was a the brother of one of the kings, Irish kings, he, now that, Scot that, now that Ireland has had grown that mighty, he wanted to become the king of Scotland. Now he wanted to become the king of Scotland, but he desired, following the tradition of their forefather, of his forefathers, he desired to be crowned on the stone of destiny or on Leah file stone. So from Ireland, the stone was moved to the, uh, to Scotland and that was the second overturning of the throne. Now finally, it was Edward I who brought that stone into London and uh, that was the third and final overturning of this stone. So it was first overturned in Jerusalem, then overturned in Ireland, then overturned in Scotland. And basically, Edward I obviously knew or felt the deep significance of this stone, 
So he brought it to England, and he was crowned also upon that, upon that stone. Uh, that was the third and the last overturning of the stone. It was now established in Westminster Bay for some time. I say some time because uh, several years ago, due to the popular demand, the stone was returned to Scotland, but it was in Westminster Bay. It was displayed for all people to see. And there was even a sign or a writing right next to it, this is Jacob's Pillow Stone. That writing has been removed later. Obviously, people are trying to falsify history. They're trying to hide important historical facts. That usually doesn't work, brethren, but people <laughs> persist nevertheless. So we have the fulfillment of uh, Jeremiah's, of Ezekiel's prophecy about the three overturning of the throne. The throne was overturned three times from Jerusalem to Ireland, from Ireland to Scotland, and the third time from Scotland to England. And on this throne sits now and occupies that throne uh, the car current Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth again she has been a symbol of one era which is now behind us. What is ahead of us is, as I mentioned to you, brethren, the total economic decline until a full collapse of the economic economy of the Anglo-Saxon world. The weakening of the Commonwealth is, seems to be almost certain. Uh, there will be sanctions imposed by Germany against the British, British uh, Empire. And who knows what else are we going to see. But anyway, after Queen Elizabeth, probably nothing will be the same. She will remain uh, a, a symbol, a symbol of one era. Turbulent era, but nevertheless one very successful era because her rule is very successful indeed in these last 70 years. We'll know, never again we'll see a monarch. We have no time to see a monarch occupying David's throne for 70 long years. And Queen Elizabeth is indeed, according to my sources, one of my sources is my dear friend Stephen Spikerman, Spikerman who is uh, a researcher who uh, indeed knows all these truths as we do. And one of our, we, well, he always confided in me that he succeeded several years ago. He succeeded to uh, have a material that he had written and on the British, on the origin of British monarchy, he succeeded to get get to the head of the parliament so that all MPs, all the parliament members, uh, were able to read it and get a witness. And in fact, we were also, back in those days, we were also considering how in the world we could get some of the, uh, some of those materials about the greatness and the origin of the American nation, the British nation, how we could get to the American public. Now, uh, I'm not going to reveal to you the details, and they're not they're not all that important, but we did manage, manage somehow in America, through an uh, interesting uh, sequence of events, somehow the Donald Trump's daughter was, we were able to reach, he was able to reach it, her, and basically give her a copy of his work, describing the uh, greatness of, of America and why America has become the uh, mightiest power in the world, at least for a short while. Queen Elizabeth is well aware of who she is. Uh, according to my sources again, uh, she is aware that she is the keeper, the custodian of the throne of David. Uh, her origin is nothing secret. If you Google, if you Google indeed the, the, the genealogy of Queen Elizabeth, you will get on internet what I have this in this booklet that I've reused for these, uh, these three messages. In this booklet, Raymond Capt, you will get exactly the genealogy of Queen Elizabeth. And uh, all those lines, uh, which shows who she is and where she comes from. Uh, let me see. Let me just, uh, well, just give you a description of, oh, here it is. On page 56 of this booklet, we have Judah. Then there is the royal house of Zara Judah, the royal house of Pharaoh Judah. Then King David. Then from him comes his, his sons, his son Solomon and Nathan. Then comes the from Solomon all the way to the last Jewish king, Sedekiah. From Sedekiah, he says there is a line saying kings of Ireland, another line kings of Scotland, another line Albert and Victoria, another line royal house of Windsor, George V, George VI, and Elizabeth II. So she from the fire shrine, and from the royal house of Zara came her late husband Philip. She knows she is the custodian. And uh, as I've been, as again, it has been 
confirmed to me by my sources. And I'm sure that, that my sources are not lying because I remember, I remember back in the last century when we published the Plain Truth magazine, a copy of the Plain Truth magazine was always sent to the Buckingham Palace upon their request. Because the, 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 the Plain Truth indeed, on several occasions, uh, brought articles about the origin of British monarchy and the, uh, all these intricate, interesting Bible uh, prophecies that gave basically birth to the British, to the British crown, the birth, I mean, to the British crown and all those prophecies by being fulfilled, actually, what came about from them is this, is this current British monarchy. So a copy of the plain truth always went to Buckingham Palace and that's not by chance, certainly not. The Queen is well aware of that. Uh, Bob Thiel, I think, revealed to us in one of his messages that, again, from uh, confidence sources that her son King Charles is also aware of their origin and then I would presume that perhaps even the King Charles descendants Harry and William are also aware of that um, so all these prophecies were fulfilled as you see that the British monarchy is in existence because God promised that to David God promised that to David and we have been privileged in our time to see and to celebrate the golden jubilee of the longest ruling British monarch. I see, I, I, again, as I said, I think her, whenever she withdraws, if she withdraws from the throne, if she abdicates, or when she dies, I think one era will be over for Britain, and another era of British decline is coming up, because Germany is flexing its muscles, and if Germans hate anyone uh, uh, for what happened... Um, if Germans hate any nation, basically because they were defeated in the Second World War, it's British in America. Germany equally hates Serbia nation because twice in, in our history, in the Ser First and in the Second World War, Serbia, who was the only East European ally to uh, the Western powers, also defeated Germans twice with terrible price, which this small nation paid. And however, Serbia has all been much oppressed and uh, uh, trodden by the German boots, but the same is awaiting is awaiting in is awaiting uh, in store. The same is in store for Britain and for America, and also for the Western Europe, because you know the um, captivity of Western Europe might be more economic. All the Western European nations uh, populated who who are made up from the lost tribes of Israel will be most likely forced to economically support the German economy. And the German War, uh, which basically happened in the last war, in the Second World War, in the last Great War under Hitler's rule. Uh, however, the Anglo-Saxon nations, who are the main victory, victorious, the main victorious force, along with the Red Army from Russia, uh, they were basically, you know, they're so much hated by Germans that the Germans are going to commit against them what they did to the Jews in the Second World War. That that is why the coming Great Tribulation, we might even call the Holocaust of Ephraim and Judah, because the nations of Ephraim and, Man and Manasseh, of course, Holocaust of Manasseh and Ephraim and Judah, and perhaps it will be the greatest and the most horrible event because uh, the number of victims will be much higher than in the Second World War. So Queen Elizabeth is aware of who she is, and we should be aware of who she is anyway. Anyway, I wanted to remind you of that because of all the seven church eras in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the only one church era, that of Philadelphia, was given the key of David. That means that that era does understand who is the modern house of David, which means also by extension that that era does understand the uh, identity of the modern house of Israel. Because one goes with the other. You see, we know that the, uh, the current, the modern house of David is ruling over at least one part of the house of Judah, which is indeed the case. And being a Philadelphia remnant, it is indeed imperative that we do understand the uh, key of David or the identity of the house of David, as well as the identity of lost Israel. So I wanted to remind you, this was a unique opportunity, the Golden Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth, I wanted to remind you of this pivotal knowledge and I wanted to remind you of our identity as well. Those who do understand the identity of the king of David, 
or his descendants, so the identity of the house of David, they also understand the identity of the modern Israel, and they can say that they are also Philadelphians. Those who do not, those who do not care about the house of Israel and the house of David, they, many of them are all the Laodiceans. Some of those people have even given up on that precious knowledge, and many others refuse to preach about the significance and importance of this. Being your servant, servant to a Philadelphia remnant, I felt it was my elder's duty to remind you on the occasion of the Golden Jubilee, to remind you of who we are. <laughs>